Hello and welcome to our ICT4D conference podcast. My name is Sonia Ritzel from CRS and I'm interviewing experts for you to talk about digital development trends, innovations and good practice. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Rivi Sterlin. She's the Gender and Technology Specialist at DAI Global and also the Director of the USAID Women Connect Challenge. Thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm a big fan of CRS and their work and their commitment to this space. And it's really wonderful to get to e-meet you and do this together, Sonia. <laughs> Thank you, Rivi. Could you please tell us a little bit more about the Women Connect Challenge? Sure. The challenge started a few years ago in response to this ever-growing gender and technology gap that we keep seeing. While there are improvements being made all over the world in terms of women's agency vis-a-vis -vis ICT, there are huge gaps that continue to grow in certain communities, especially those have, that are restrictive, that are having a populist swing, etc. And certainly we all see that in times of crises, women's rights and agency are often the first things to go in light of COVID recently, but in light of a stressed and traumatized world, it's more and more important all the time to make sure that our digital development strategies that are intended to serve those that need information the most really reach the women who could benefit most from them. We know that women are the key to sustainable community development. We know they're in charge of the health and education and a lot of the unpaid and informal labor and economics of their communities. And this push to take all of these development sectors digital actually really runs the risk of excluding more and more women. I know that seems anathema because we see cheaper cell phones and lower connectivity costs and more advanced technologies like TV white space and other things being rolled out. But the more and faster we roll out technology, the more women actually suffer this gap. And what the Women Connect Challenge was all about are identifying really those social norms and cultural barriers that keep women offline. It's not necessarily the standard things like cost and literacy and access that stymie a lot of women from being able to use ICT, but in restrictive communities, it's those cultural barriers and social norms that want to keep women underempowered. And that's why, you know, there's a billion plus women that if they could own a phone, they probably would. But because of family and community constraints, they can't. And that's really where the Women Connect Challenge comes in, is trying to find ways to create sustainable, appropriate, and really gender equitable opportunities for women to engage with technology in a way that isn't going to make them a target or a perceived threat to their community, but to really show that women and technology can be a great force multiplier for development. Thank you, Ravi. So today we would like to talk about practical advice to achieve just this goal. The Women Connect Challenge has identified five strategies. Could you please tell us more about those? Sure, I'd be happy to. So none of these strategies are necessarily brand new. I came into this field about 20 years ago and research was already being done by wonderful researchers like Sophia Heyer and Inika Buskins and Nancy Hafkin and many others that were already talking about the fact that there was going to be a looming gender digital divide unless we took a look at specifically how women need to use technology in the context of their communities. And so a lot of this research has been done, but what I have found in my career is a lot of donors and funders and development agencies don't necessarily read research or they look at it and go, this is too long, this is too hard, this is a challenge, it's not going to fit into our funding or program life cycle. What are some tangible ways that we can do better programming to make ICT and digital development more gender equitable? And I'd say that from the Women Connect Challenge and really from two decades of research that I've done with other people and including a long time as a practitioner in the field working in over 30 countries is, you know, if we have to categorize them, I'd say there's five. The first is changing the social norms and the cultural perceptions. I've talked a little bit about this, but this really underlies all the explorations in sort of gender inequities when it comes to digital development. Another really important one is cultivating women's confidence. So in a lot of communities that I go into, and I'm sure your listeners will agree, women have such lower self-efficacy and self-confidence than their male counterparts. 
So they say things like, I'm too dumb to use this technology, or I just can't do it, or I didn't have enough schooling. And so we need to create opportunities for women to feel comfortable using technology, especially when they've heard about things like fakes and frauds and scams and all the threats that we see, the online gender-based violence. We really need to work with women to make sure that they are aware and empowered to use technology. A third proven strategy is designing creative women-centric technology. And what I mean by that is not just assuming that all women use technology the same. There's sort of this sense, I think, in technology that, hey, technology is just a tool. Everybody uses it the same, etc. But we even know in a Western context, now that we're looking at things like AI, that things have hidden biases in them. There's all sorts of blind spots. So really understanding that when you're dealing with poor and rural women and the most unconnected women, you're dealing with populations that have constraints with literacy. The population that is the most illiterate in the world are poor women. And they also speak many unwritten languages that aren't represented on the internet, or they have form factors that maybe a cell phone isn't the right form factor for them to use because their husbands or in-laws will take it and sell it or appropriate it. So maybe we need to look at other devices that aren't seen as such a threat or a valuable piece of property. And then I would say overarching are two proven strategies, which is one, create economic opportunities for women when they use technology, and two, develop community support. I think those two just go without saying and should be part of any digital development strategy. Technology cannot be a tax on the people we're trying to reach. It really needs to help them create economic opportunities for, for themselves and their families and their communities. And of course, we can't just drop technology into a community and assume that it's going to be welcomed by all. We really have to get the explicit permission and buy-in from leaders in the community who otherwise can set fatwas and mandates and local laws about women's technology use. So making sure that the people that are most critical of technology being used by women become their chief advocates. Thank you, Ravi. That's a very I guess, holistic approach to the topic and I'm very excited to hear more, particularly when you were saying considering social, cultural and um, local context is crucial for effective user-centric design of digital tools. And we talk about this a lot in this podcast series, but when you mention incorporating women-centric programming, do you have some specific advice or maybe some example you can share with our audience? So sure, let's talk some a bit about these social norms and the women-specific technologies. I'd say in the social norms piece, one of our projects that we funded was with Equal Access International up in Kano, Nigeria. And what they did was submit a proposal that suggested they would work with several technology and civil society NGOs in the Kano region and work with conservative clerics and development-focused community radio to build up a series to help families understand the role that technology could play in communities. Prior to this, the clerics had said that internet use and mobile use by women was amoral, it was uh, too Western, it was going to bring shame on the family. And so husbands and fathers were prohibiting, you know, wives and children from using the internet. The internet is a wild west. It is a frontier of great information and false information and fake news and all of these things that could be seen as certainly threats to stability and social order. But what Equal Access did is working with clerics, working with local media stars, and working with these organizations, put together a curriculum that really helped mothers and fathers understand the risks of the internet, the benefits, how to work with their kids as a family unit to explore the benefits of being online, how to build trust and social capital online so that you knew where were some dangerous places to go, what were good places to go. And it became this very holistic community-based exploration where all of the fathers by the end of the nine-month training, 100% of them said, absolutely, internet and technology has a place in our home. And I'm gonna buy my wife's phones and make sure my children have access to the internet for their schooling. And it was such a huge turnaround to go from a very low percentage of men that thought that the internet could be an okay place for women to 100% saying, actually, because now we understand, we see the value of this. And we also can find Quranic rationalization and justification for women using this because this supports their education and familial obligations. 
that's a very inspiring example and I can see how many organizations with strong community influence like for example faith-based organizations like CRS or, or similar ones can really help absolutely so for anyone looking for more examples or resources by the Women Connect Challenge or their partners we have added a few links in the podcast description so I guess my final question for you is What do you think different actors could do to assist this goal? Well, I think community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, local actors, these are the ones that really need to push back on strategies that are top-down digital development strategies. And I, I work in so many communities around the world with so many women who don't even understand there's probably a, you know tens of thousands of M app, M health, M ag, M education apps out there because that is simply not the context in which they experience technology. I just want to talk a little bit about one more project that we've been working on with a very small community-based organization in Bamako called Molly Health. The women in the four slums that they work with, you know, 98% of them are illiterate. They also speak Bambara, which is mostly an oral language. It doesn't have a lot of representation, as you can imagine, on the web. They don't have smartphones. The 2% that do have smartphones, these are first-generation smartphones that can barely even access the web, let alone download any apps. So what Molly Health did was work with software engineers in Bamako that were local and understood women's information needs to come up with a vocal and photo and movie clip social network that's kind of the best of Facebook and the best of WhatsApp, but had all the features that the women wanted to have this text-free social network. The user experience was so positive, and these women really benefited from the health information they could exchange, from collectively selling their health goods into Bamako markets that had been closed to them before. I mean, it opened up the entire internet to them in a way that was super appropriate for their information needs, but also their limitations in terms of devices, literacy, skills, and confidence. And then we would find that their husbands found these apps so fascinating that they wanted to use them and learn more about women's health and women's economic empowerment. So the trickle down effect at the household level was like, wow, my wife is doing this really cool thing. I want to look at it too. You just get all of these efforts that when you have good design that really, really addresses women's challenges and their aspirations and puts that together, you come up with some really unique creative software, hardware, and policies that we don't get from the standard, hey, here's a smartphone, go download some apps and, and search, you know, the kind of mechanisms and models and modalities that we are used to. Thank you. That's a fantastic example. And uh, yeah, also reminds me very much at our recent podcast with Jocelyn Williams at um, Everyone Mobile. And I think just to that point with confidence, I mean, when you have women who do have this lower self-confidence and lower self-efficacy just because of their station in life, it's really important to do projects that almost help them build the confidence to use technology in the first place. So working with Viamo in Tanzania, Women Connect Challenge funded a project where women could use the 321 service to make free calls in to just to understand what the internet is, what a social network is, what kind of phones do you have to have to do this? What are the hidden costs to and threats that you can find online and how to work against them? And uh, this service had over 200,000 listeners during its pilot phase who just called to get that information to understand what is this technology thing and is it right for me so that there's so much agency in just women saying, actually, I do want to explore this and I'm not afraid to do it and I'm not stupid. And I think that's one of the first steps is really working with women to understand the limitations that they not only the communities impose on them, but the ones they impose on themselves. I mean, development is, is fundamentally a psychological state change. And I think we forget about that when we just drop in technology, but we need to make sure that, that people you know, have readiness to experience that technology. Thank you. That's a very strong point. Is there anything else you would like to add? I do think the Women Connect Challenge has given USAID and its partners an opportunity to build an evidence base around these. But these strategies, I just think there's no excuse at this point for the gender digital divide. We know enough and it is hard work and we have to just say we are going to make these changes and we are going to be this much more pro-woman in our programming because otherwise we're all complicit in growing this gap as opposed to closing it. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. And, um, Thank you for we'll such an enjoyable the... opportunity. And please, to anybody that wants to reach out at any time, let's talk about how to close the gender digital divide. 
more information about our upcoming podcasts or webinars are on our website ict4dconference.org. 